suddenly um, um, it's affecting their personality and they're now becoming a uh, behavioral perception expression of this um, hybrid DNA and they start to operate with a hybrid DNA in terms of their uh, behavior and attitudes and one key thing this hybrid DNA has or has not compared with the general population is empathy if you don't have empathy with people you don't have empathy with the consequences for others of your actions then your actions have no limits now today coming around to the question because it's all, in these things is now always a preliminary to, to get across where you're really coming from um, DNA databases now allow a highly uh, sophisticated way of finding out who's got the bloodline and who hasn't. Um, so um, they're bringing it in uh, totalitarian uh, tiptoe style by um, they know that they can't at the moment get away with saying we're going to have a DNA database and everyone's going to be on it. So what they do um, is they say anyone who's arrested for a crime even though they, they, they might not be charged and certainly not um, appear in court or be found guilty, their DNA is taken at the point of the charge and they then have a massive uh, effort, usually um, uh, impossible, to get that DNA taken off the, um, off the base. And even then, it's, they've only got their word for it's been taken off. And what they're doing is building by stealth in this way an increasingly vast database and eventually they'll reach the point where they'll say well look we're gonna have everybody now and people say well they've got nearly everybody anyway so well who cares you know that, that that's the way they work and break down resistance and the, the, they want it for many reasons but the key reason um, a key reason is they want to know who's got the bloodline and who hasn't another reason is this everybody um, is uh, broadcasting vibrating to a certain frequency we were in the same frequency range, otherwise we couldn't see each other, but there's subtle differences between everybody. We always have, have our unique vibration, unique vibrational code. If you know what that code is, then if you want to target that person with vibrational interference on a physical, emotional, or mental level, mind control, I'm talking about the latter one, then you can target them specifically on their unique frequency. Once you have the DNA, you can work out what that frequency is. So that's another reason why they want um, the DNA database. It's not for catching criminals. They're interested in catching criminals. Um, criminals for them are just other ways, at the highest level I'm talking about, are just other ways to justify more and more control to protect the people from criminals. They don't want a society that without crime, without violence, without terrorism, is the worst nightmare. How do, you, how, do you, how do you impose an Orwellian state on a society of harmony? You can't do it. You can only do it on a society that's divided and ruled and in fear of everything. That's why we have a society. We I would like to start the discussion with this drawing that shows the Mayan Queen Mu as a child consulting a soothsayer. It shows that the queen is receiving the words from their serpent god, but through the mouth of the serpent of the uh, soothsayer. The queen is shown on the left side of the drawing inside the red rectangle with her left hand on her face as she is seated facing the soothsayer. She is depicted as a young girl, perhaps in her early teens. The soothsayer is shown in the green rectangle and she is seated in front of the queen with what appears to be a little table between them. She is shown in front of two other women and two huts. Between, behind the soothsayer in the yellow rectangle is a huge serpent which towers above the scene. Notice that it has its mouth open as if it is speaking to the soothsayer and the queen as well. The book that included this drawing in its pages said that the winged serpent behind her represented the protective genius of the Mayan Empire. So the snake protected the Mayans. This is a representation of Prince Ko of the Mayans in the heat of battle. His head is near the center of the drawing and behind him and taller than he appears is the 
winged serpent, also representing the protective genius of the Mayan Empire. So the serpent was an important part of the worship of the Mayan and Aztec people, which means that it was an important part of the South American culture before the earliest Europeans landed in America. The American people have been told by the majority of the historians who have examined this nation's past that the name America was named after Amerigo Vespucci, supposedly the navigator for Christopher Columbus. But there is an alternative explanation. William Still, in his book entitled New World Order, offers the following explanation. The word America may be the product of secret societies. In an 1895 magazine named Lucifer, notice the name, Lucifer is the name of the magazine, James Price gave an insight into the meaning of the word America. He said that the supreme god of the Mayan culture of Central America, known as Quetzalcoatl elsewhere, was known as Amaru in Peru. Amaru's territory was known as Amaraku, Amaraku, and the word Ka means territory, so it's a territory of Amaru. According to Price, from the latter comes the word America. America, or Amaraku, is translated land of the serpent. Mr. Price was not the only one to make this claim. Robert B. Stacy Mudd wrote a book entitled Atlantis, Mother of Empires, in which he attempts to make the claim that the Mayans came from the nation known as Atlantis, an island that allegedly sank during an earthquake. This is not the place to discuss his charges, but he does draw another startling conclusion. Quetzalcoatl, the Mayan god, was known as Kukukan among the Aztecs. In Peru, he was known as Amaru. But all of these names have an identical meaning, in other words, the feathered serpent. From the Peruvian name comes Amaraca. This is a photograph of a feathered serpent in the 33rd degree Masonic Temple in Washington, D.C. Notice that the head of the serpent has wings. It is a feathered serpent. Um, and these ancient cultures, they all have their stories of this interbreeding between a reptilian race, and it's not all reptilian, but this seems to be a predominant factor, and uh, humans. Um, in fact, the um, ancient emperors of China used to claim the right to be emperor because of their descendants from the serpent gods. Everywhere you find this reference in different phrases and names to the serpent gods. And out of here, the Sumer, Egypt, um, Babylon area came some of the most significant bloodlines which then moved up across the world um, to become the, um, the, the, the ruling, controlling families of today. And a lot of the, um, the gargoyles that you find on churches that were built by the secret society as like the uh, Knights Templar and the castles of these elite families have a um, reptilian look about them. So do many of the coats of arms and stuff that you find in the elite families and military and stuff. Um, in the city of London and where the uh, temple meets the city of London in the center of the road is this another reptilian figure. Just a coincidence, nothing to worry about. So what you have all over the world is this recurring theme, which only when you kind of open your mind to this, you start to say, bloody hell, it's everywhere, of the dragon and the, the reptilian um, imagery. I mean, in the East, in places like Japan and, and China, where there was also massive interbreeding in China with these entities, it seems, you have the dragon at the very heart of the, um, the culture. Um, the Messiah, the word Messiah, it seems, comes from Mesa, which is the Nile crocodile, because the pharaohs were anointed 